Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatsoever time and wherever you're joining us from. It's always an exciting time to be right here as we learn, we actually could learn, could build, and could share things together. Today, I have a special guest with me who will be doing justice to what we are learning. Don't forget, it is 30 days of data science, and it is set for you to help you build your technical skills in data science and machine learning, you know, building a project, a portfolio project, portfolio worthy project. So I put it that way. And last time we've learned a couple of things. You've learned the basics of Pythons. You've learned, you know, how to write a first program, the rock, paper, scissors game. And today we want to build machine learning model. Yes. And our guest, Pamela Fox, who is a principal cloud advocate at Microsoft for Python is going to do amazing justice to this. Hi, Pamela. I'm so excited to have you on this show. Uh, hello, everyone. And hi, everyone in the chat. Thanks for saying hi and saying where you're from. It's always nice. I always love to see people saying stuff in the chat. You know, it makes me think that there's actually people out there in the world and I'm not just in a closet like I am right now. Yes, yes, it is. I, I love that. Please keep introducing wherever you're calling from, uh, you, you're joining us from. I would like to do some shout out as well to you know those cities. I love it. Stockholm, wow, amazing. Okay, so today is, 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 is a bit really important uh, uh, as we take our journey, our learning journey forward. Uh, we've done some things. You've learned some basics of Python and you're wondering when do I get to build my first machine learning model Today is the day, and now is the time. So stay tuned with us, and don't you lose any focus at all. <laughs> Back to Pamela. Pamela, we'd like to just introduce yourself and tell us something fun about you. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, I am Pamela Fox. And let's see. Well, yesterday, I celebrated Halloween, and I dressed up like a donkey unicorn. <laughs> which is from Encanto, which is like our favorite movie because I have a three-year-old and a, a five-month-old. Uh, so I, I made a donkey unicorn costume and also one for my baby. <laughs> so we were wow. two donkey unicorns. And apparently not many people know about the donkey unicorns from Encanto because nobody understood what we were. Uh, but I'm, I'm a big fan <laughs> and it was very fun to dance in the streets in my donkey unicorn costume. So that was that was quite fun. <laughs> I can I can imagine the fun right here. So I mean, I'd love to maybe participate in next year. But over, I mean, uh, here in Nigeria, we don't celebrate Halloween. But let's see. Okay, over to what we have today. I'm going to hand this over to you as you walk us through how to build a product pricing model and deploy on Azure. Over to you. All right. So. Welcome everyone. So yeah, so you know so far that I like to wear donkey costumes. Uh, besides that, I also really like to do Python and that's what I do at Microsoft. I also really like to do web development and that's what I've done professionally. So um, I've done web development for Coursera, where I was one of the first engineers uh, for Khan Academy, where I actually both did development and made most of the Khan Academy programming courses. Um, and I've done web development other places too. So at my heart, I'm a web developer and I love the web, but I also do use data science. Uh, a lot of times when I'm trying to understand, you know, something about the data of, of my web app and trying to understand, you know, like are people, you know, are people learning like on Khan Academy? Uh, so I do love to be able to use data science techniques. So today we're gonna combine data science and web uh, so first, I'm going to build a regression model using Python and scikit-learn. And then I'm going to deploy the model as an HTTP API on Azure Functions. So we're going to get to see you know, multiple sides of the journey here. Uh, so first of all, all of you, if you want to, can get these slides from this tiny URL. So it's tinyurl.com slash regression.slides. Uh, so if you do want to have them available for you to, to look at in your own computer, you can grab them there and also link again at the at the end of the talk. So first of all, what are we actually going to make a model for? 
So, um, you know, I think originally we said it was going to be product pricing, but I thought it'd be really fun to take a look at the Stack Overflow Developer Survey. I don't know if you all have seen this, but every year they interview people on Stack Overview, view, <laughs> Overflow to try and figure out what, you know, what they like. Um, so we'll, you know, we can look at technology, most popular technologies, and we can see, you know, of all the languages, JavaScript is currently the most popular technology, uh, but Python is number four. And honestly, these are my four favorite languages anyway, JavaScript, HTML, SQL, Python. Those are my four faves. So, you know, they're in the top four, so I'm happy. So they do all kinds of, they ask, you know, ask people all kinds of questions. And they also make this data set available for downloading the full CSV. So I thought it'd be fun if we downloaded the CSV and then used it to make a salary predictor uh, because they also ask people how much money they earn. So it's like, well, if we know all this information about people and we know how much money they earn, maybe we can make a model, a regression model that can predict their salary. So I thought that sounded kind of fun. Okay, so the first thing we do is download the data. Uh, so here already, I've you know I'm importing the pandas library for data science. That's we're going to be using that quite heavily. Um, and I download the zip file. So you know here I'm downloading the zip file and I'm opening up the CSV inside the zip file. And then I tell pandas to read that CSV. And then I just set some display options for pandas. And then I want to see what does it look like, right? What am I dealing with? So, you know, you want to be able to explore the data in some way. So I'm using the tail to look at the last three rows in the data. Uh, so let me run this here. So this is actually, I'm actually running a Jupyter notebook. This looks like slides, but the truth is it's actually a notebook. I'll show you. Um, so this is actually a notebook here, but I am using it like it's slides. <laughs> so here we have, I've run the cell in the notebook and now we can see the last three rows in this data here. Um, so I can take a look and see all the different questions they ask. So they have things like what languages you've worked with. Here they have total compensation. So that's that's the salary metric that I'm interested in. And you see some people don't fill that out, right? So for those people, we aren't gonna be able to use this data. Uh, they also have things like how many years they've been coding, how many years they've been coding professionally. Uh, education level, uh, what kind of, you know, how they're employed. So there's lots of interesting demographic information here that we could use. Uh, so, you know, when I look at this, I'm looking through the columns and thinking like, what is it, you know, what is it that I want to use in order to make a regression model? Um, so what do you all think? You're in the chat. What, what do you think would be good predictors for someone's salary, a developer's salary? Any ideas? Let's see if we can get get any uh, any thoughts in the chat here. So waiting for them to drop, and you can ask that again so that we can have responses. Okay, we have one here. Say experience. Nice. Oh, experience. Yeah, years of yeah, years of experience. Yeah, years, years of experience. Yeah, skill so set. Years of experience. Mm -hmm. From LinkedIn, we have skill set, Christina. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a lot. Okay, great. So there's actually a lot of people voting for years of experience. Uh, so good. So that's actually what I was thinking too, and and also other good ideas too, like skill set. Uh, I thought skill set was also uh, also a, you know a good thing, but years of experience. The reason I was attracted to it because it's just a number, and then you know being able you know using a number to predict a number that felt like you know something doable. Where skill set. You know, uh, a skill set, I think, is like a comma separated list of languages. So, I, you know, I had to think more about how I would take that into account. So, yeah. OK, so lots of people think that years of experience. So great. So that's actually what I started off with. Now, for those of you who have other ideas, this is what I'm going to encourage you to take this data set and, you know, fork it and, and try out those ideas, too, to see how they work. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is clean some data, OK? Uh, so the data that we're trying to predict is 
in the column converted comp yearly. So this is the yearly compensation. And I think they converted it based off countries that people were in to try and normalize for the fact that countries have, you know, different currency and inflation and, and that sort of thing. So I use this converted comp yearly and I, we call that the label. So when we're doing regression, we have the label, which is the thing we're predicting. And then we have the features, which are the, you know, the variables that can be used to predict the label. So first I drop all the rows that don't have a label. Right, because if we don't know their salary, we can't really use that as, uh, you know, as a as a data point. Then I drop the rows. I dropped rows that had what I consider to be extreme outliers. I probably didn't have to do this because the model should take care of it. But I noticed some people saying they made like two million dollars, and I just thought, you know, that's like too much. <laughs> so I just I dropped ones where people earned more than hundred thousand. May I probably shouldn't have dropped them, but you know, I was like, that's too much. <laughs> Um, and then finally, I'm using describe in order to see, you know, what it finally looks like, right? So let's let's run this. So what we can see here, uh, you know, this gives us the statistics of our column, and this gives us an idea for, you know, have we done a good job cleaning it, right? Does it look reasonable? So it says the average salary is eighty thousand. Okay, that sounds kind of reasonable for developers. Um, we, you know, developers tend to earn fairly well. Uh, it says a minimum salary is one one. So I don't know who put that they earn $1 a year, if it's true that they earn $1 a year. So I did almost drop ones at that end, but then I couldn't decide where to, where to like, you know, to cut it off. Cause then, then it was like, well, somebody says they earn $10. Somebody and then it's like, all right, I'm just going to let the model deal with it. <laughs> um, so you don't always have to actually, you know, manually drop them like this. Okay. So now uh, let's clean the more comps. So all of, uh, lots of you said that we should use years code. So years of coding and years of coding professionally, uh, you know, as being years of experience as predictive features. So that's what we're going to start off with. These are both numeric features. So I make a list of the numeric feature column names. And then I'm going through and I'm making them numeric because right now I, uh, they, they came through as strings in the CSV. So I'm telling Pandas that I want them to be numeric fields. And I'm telling it to just make it work. <laughs> when we say coerce, it's like, just, you know, turn those into numbers. Uh, and then I also dropped rows where people didn't specify these, uh, you know, these numbers, because we can't use those as predictors. So that's the cleaning I'm doing. And then I'm going to check it out. Uh, so here, when we look at it, uh, now we see the mean for years of coding is 15 years and years coding professional is 10 years. So that sounds kind of reasonable. Maybe you spend five years learning the code and then you start doing it professionally. Uh, and then we've got a max of 50 and exactly 50. So I don't know, maybe if Stack Overflow capped it at 50. That's something that also to look at is like, you know, what did the survey, what options did the survey give, right? Did they have just a field? Did they have a drop down? So it's possible that, you know, maybe some people have code, been coding more than 50 years. I think my dad, gosh, has my dad been coding more than 50 years? I think so. If you count punch cards as coding, I think my dad's been coding for more than 50 years. So maybe, you know, maybe he did the survey. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Now we're going to visualize the label column just to have another way of looking at the data. So this is using matplotlib, which is a nice way to visualize our data. Uh, so we get out the data and we set up a, a histogram based off the data. And I also overlay lines for the mean and lines for the median. So we can see that the mean is this magenta, the pink line. And that one's around 80,000. That's what we saw when we described it. And then the median is less than that, like more around 65,000. And a lot of times the median is a better, a more descriptive statistic because the means can get thrown off by those people earning, you know, $2 million dollars you know, $400,000, right? You know, the, the mean can be very thrown off by those outliers, right? But if we look at the median, then that's actually, you know, much more reasonable because we can see there's actually quite a few outliers here. All right, so let's see, we visualize those. Now let's visualize the feature columns. Okay, so those numeric features. So I'm gonna make a very similar, uh, you know, very similar map plot graph here. And once again, overlay the overlay the median and the mean. And so we can see, you know, it's like an average uh, or a median of 11 years of coding 
and about seven years of coding professionally. Okay, so now we can start to see, are these things actually related? So lots of us thought, you know, that these things would be related. If you've been coding for more years, probably you can earn more money, but let's find out if they're actually related. Uh, so this is, <laughs> this is a scatter plot. A scatter plot is often used to try and get a visual feel for whether things are correlated. Um, so you can look at this and say like, yeah, there's maybe some correlation here. It's not, it doesn't look just like a, you know, a straight thick diagonal line. Um, but uh, there's maybe some correlation here. A better metric, instead of just staring at a scatter plot, because, you know, eyes can deceive you. Don't trust your eyes. <laughs> uh, so instead of just staring at a, a, a scatter plot, what we can instead do is actually uh, measure correlation using the core method. So we tell it to actually measure that correlation. And we can see that it says um, 0.32 for years coding and 0.328 for years coding professional. Okay, and correlation can go all the way up to uh, one. So 0.32 is not a super high correlation, but what we can see is that they're somewhat correlated and we can see that years coding professional is more correlated slightly than years coding. And that does make sense because, you know, you, you're, you're probably getting hired more based on your professional experience than your, your hobby experience. So this seems, you know, promising. It, it seems like we might be able to build a model based off of this. Okay, so now let's actually build a model. Uh, so let's see. All right, so in order to build a model, what we need to do is separate the data into test data set and training data set right? Because we need to first train the model and then we want to see how it does. And the way we can see how it does is to be able to check it on some data that we held out of the data set, right? And we need that to be, you know, we need the, the test data set and the training data set to be, uh, you know, random samples that are representative of, of each other. Uh, so let's first split the data into the features and the labels. So the features are going to be the data for all the numeric features. And the labels uh, will, you know, that'll be the data for all the labels, the, the salaries, okay? Uh, so let me run that. All right, so we can see we've split it out. So features, so this is a row that has, you know, years code and years code professional, years code, years code professional, and then labels, these are the salaries. So this is just four of them, just to get an idea for what our data looks like, but actually, there's, I think, around 34,000 rows that we're looking at. And now, in order to do the split, we're going to use scikit-learn and the train test split function. And we pass it the x and the y, and we tell it what we want our split to be. And so we could change this into, you know, like 0 0.25 if we want a three-quarter uh, test train split. And then we tell it to do the splitting. And here we've got. Uh, sorry, yeah. Pramela, I just want to clarify here. So yeah. after we've downloaded our data, we sort of explore the data, right? And it is important in the life cycle so that you get uh, familiar with the data, you understand the relationship and the distribution among mm -hmm. this data. And by doing that, you do some visualizations and also this understanding of correlation. So why are you separating uh, the data into two? Yeah, so we want to do that because we want to be able to evaluate if our model is good. And mm -hmm. we won't know if our model is good if we don't have a, a, you know data to test it on. Uh, so every time, whenever we train a machine learning model, we always need to have uh, the holdout data, the, the testing data that we're you know, keeping separate uh, so that we can check to see if our model is is good, at least on that data, that still doesn't, it's still not going to tell us whether our data is going to be good once we apply it to the real world, right? Um, so like one thing about the Stack Overflow survey is that their gender demographics, oh my gosh, it's is really sad. <laughs> Let me, uh, where is the developer profile? Demographics, okay. Uh, so they only had 5% of the respondents identified as women. Five hmm. percent. There's way more. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So much more than five percent of developers are women. 
<laughs> the living. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I would have expected at least 20, 25%, depending on the, on the country. Um, so we know that this Stack Overflow data set you know, it itself is biased. So we're going to, you know, we're, you know, so we, we have multiple sources of, of bias here, but, uh, but at least we can take part of the data set and take it out uh, so that once we have a model, we can check to see how the model does on that holdout data Thank there. You. Thank you for the clarification. So it's very clear now the reason why we need to separate our data is you need to ascertain and also check the performance even before you take it out there. That doesn't guarantee that is always accurate, but you just need to test. When you make a drugs, when you develop a new solution, you test it before taking it to the market. That's simply what we're trying to do there. Thank you, and we'll move on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so you can see that what it says, the training set is gonna be 26,000 rows, and the test set is going to be 86,000 rows. So we're gonna train the model from 26,000 points of data, which is a decent amount of data. Um, but you know, nothing like millions of rows, like, like if we were Google training on something, uh, and then we'll test it on 8,000 rows of data. <clears throat> so there's many different models in scikit-learn that you can use for regression. And I do recommend this, the scikit-learn documentation. It's really good. I was reading it on the weekend just like, for fun, <laughs> uh, but it, I just think it's really good documentation. Like it really does try to, to help you learn. And you know that's what we're all doing here. So, uh, so I do recommend going through the Scikit-Learn documentation as well. They have you know this whole user guide about regression models because they have many many ways of doing regression. So we're going to try about five different ways of doing regression, but there's more ways in here that you can read about. Uh, so we're going to start with the simplest, which is the linear regression model, which is uh, more specifically it's the ordinary least squares linear regression. Uh, so it's basically going to try and fit a line to the data. So you imagine that's, you know, this, you know, imagine a, a scatter plot, imagine trying to fit a line, uh, you know, a linear line through that data. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to run this model and tell it to fit on the training data. And then we can look and see how it did, you know, what it looks like. So it comes out with, um, here I'm printing out the coefficients and the intercept. Uh, so if you can imagine a line, a line is often, if you remember, you know, like high school math, uh, we had y equals mx plus b. Uh, and that's when you have one thing influencing x. But remember, we have two numeric features, right? We have years code and years code pro. So this is really y equals, um, you know, years code x. Uh, plus like B, you know, B1 plus years code pro times X plus B2. So it's trying to figure out the values of the coefficients. So it says these are the values of those two coefficients. So instead of just M, we're getting an M1 and M2. And then it's also saying this is the intercept, right? So, you know, so now we can actually have the equation of a, of a line, right? So 1, 2, 0, 3, X plus 1, 363x plus 51, something like that. So our line, our line equation that it's coming up with is something like that. So it's really making a making a line uh, that's trying to fit the best to the data. Oh yeah, so good questions. The can we apply a correction to the bias? So you know, because I was mentioning the bias that comes from the fact that this data set is, uh, you know, is not representative of everyone. Um, and can we apply corrections to it? I do think lots of people have worked on, are trying to work on ways to a- address uh, bias in data sets. Um, I haven't tried it myself with, with this data set. I mean, the best thing would be if we just had more data from, from women, especially when it comes to predicting salary, because there's a lot of data around the fact that um, you know, uh, women may not ask for as high of a salary as men or, um, you know, because of um, sexism may, may receive less. So we really, it would really be nice to just get uh, a better, you know, a better sample of the population, right? Uh, but that's a great question and that's something I'd like to look into more. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so we did a linear regression. Now we're going to see how did it do? 
right? We need to evaluate how our model did because we can't really tell from this whether it's good. We just see like, okay, it came up with a line. So uh, we're gonna use various techniques for evaluating how it does. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is actually use our test set. So here we're using the test set and we're going to make predictions based off the test set. And then we're gonna compare those predictions to their actual values, right? Because we know the actual values for the test set because this is from our so the survey data. So we can see, okay, for this, you know, this row, you know, with this amount of years coding and this amount of years coding professional, what did we predict? And then what did that person actually report as their compensation? Uh, so, you know, we can look and see that, you know, a predicted label was 83,000, but they only reported 47,000. So we can definitely see there's some discrepancies here. But we want to actually be able to put a number on how off these predictions are. We want to be able to describe the accuracy of these predictions. So let's see. So how could we do that? So first we could visualize. It's always kind of fun to visualize, but we're not going to rely on visualization. Uh, so this is this is a visualization of actual versus predicted. So you can definitely see that it, there's some issues here. Uh, but we really want to put some numbers on it. So what we're going to do is use the scikit-learn metrics module. And it has uh, two, two methods in it, uh, mean squared error and R2 score, two functions. So mean squared error, or the, is, you know, is a very common one, uh, or more commonly root me mean squared error. So this basically, you know, if you imagine uh, this graph here, the root mean squared error means measuring the distance between each point and the line and seeing how much error, right? Because when a point is far from the line, that, that means there's an error there, right? So measuring, adding up all those errors, and then finally uh, taking the average and then taking the square root of that. So that is the root mean squared error. Uh, so higher means worse. And then R2 is a different metric, which is trying to, saying how much does this, um, you know, does this predict the variance? So R2, we actually want, um, we want, we want it to be higher. R2 can be as high as one. So let's just see, you know, what these are. So we can see, um, oh, let me, let me change this one. Here we go. All right. So the root mean squared error is 62,000. So that means that on average, there's an error of about 62,000 in salary prediction which is actually pretty high, right? Because 62,000 is a lot of money <laughs> and that could be plus or minus 62,000. So our model is not doing particularly well right now. Um, and, we all, and we see an R2 of 0 0.1 and the highest is one. Um, so the R2 is also not very high. What do you think of our stats? <laughs> <laughs> this is really interesting. I mean, and this sort of simulates the ideal scenario, the, you know, when you start working, um, it doesn't come out perfect the first time, you know, and uh, it will not always come out perfect, you know, <laughs> just what is the acceptable, you know, level of performance or accuracy that you can work with. But let's get to see what our participants, you know, what learners, you know, have to say, whatever you have on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or YouTube, can you comment? What should we do here? Okay, uh, I'm not getting any response yet. I guess they are also thinking through this. You know, uh, what happened? Is this <laughs> is this the best performing model to you? Or uh, I mean, what would you say if your model returned these results? Yeah, well, so linear regression is not a very sophisticated model, right? It's only, uh, you know, it's trying to fit a, a line to to two variables, and uh, you know, how can a, can a line, can a simple line actually predict, you know, predict these things? Is it actually linear? Uh, so what we, yeah, what we should do instead is try some other some other kinds of regression, and yeah, we, yeah, I there we go. Have update from here yeah, from Nasruddin. Saying, oh, try a random forest model. Yeah. Amazing. That's a good suggestion. We will see if we can try that out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So we are going to, we are going to actually try, try and enforce. All right. So yeah, so we're going to experiment with more models. As I was saying, there are a ton of models for regression and uh, we're going to experiment with a few of them. Uh, and we also are going to um, try adding more features. We're going to try that later. So Sharon suggested that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to try all these things. These are great ideas. Uh, so there are other linear algorithms. So we'll start with trying another linear algorithm. Um, the, the main other ones on scikit-learn are Lasso and Ridge. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is just generalize my evaluation process because I'm about to try a bunch of models and I want to be able to compare them. So I'm just writing, this is just cleaning up my work. So I just made a single function, evaluate model. And so I can call that every time I want to evaluate the most recent model and it'll uh, put the results in a table and also visualize it. So. This is just me getting ready to be able to do a bunch of comparisons. Okay, so we'll start with another linear regression and just see you know, how this does. Um, and what we see is that it basically does exactly the same. It's, there's a tiny difference, it's actually worse <laughs> uh, because this, this particular one actually isn't, isn't well designed for this data. This lasso is better for uh, situations where only a few features predict a label. But in this situation, actually, we probably want more and more features to break the label. So <clears throat> Lasso did worse, <laughs> but you know, let's let's keep trying. Oh, we've got some great thoughts from the from the chat too. So Rahim is saying that the R two score is too low. Yeah, our R two is only 0 0.11 right now. As you're saying, that is really low. So hopefully, we can get that higher by the end. Uh, so now, this, isn't it interesting that you know our participants are actually following through and also thinking through what we are doing? I, I love this. Yeah, and it's great. To also, I assume Raheem probably has actually you know a lot of um, data science experience in in the field. So having a feel for what these numbers are, right? So looking at that and just instantly knowing like that is too low, right? So Raheem knows that uh, you know he you know, Raheem is looking for sixty percent. <laughs> well, he's okay. got a feel. <laughs> let's see. So let's see if we can make <laughs> if we can impress Raheem. I don't know if we'll ever get to that sixty percent, but we can try. Okay. Um, the next one we can try is the decision tree. So instead of doing a line, a decision tree, you can you know imagine it as a decision tree. Like it says, like oh, is this thing greater than this value? Then go down this, and is this greater than this value? Then do this, and this greater than this value. So it, it can, it can, you know, it's more sophisticated in what, you know, how it can model the results. So, and we can actually see, we can visualize the decision tree. Uh, we, there's actually a few different ways we can visualize it. So here you can see, like it says, okay, is feature zero greater than 7.5? Is feature one less than 2.5? Is feature zero, you know, so it does this, it comes up with all of these branches in order to come up with, you know, salary predictions here. So that's one way of visualizing it. There's also another way of visualizing decision trees. And this one takes a little bit of time to run. So I'll just check out um, what were the suggestions from the chat here. Yeah, a lot of people definitely want to add more features. So we are going to, we're definitely going to do that as well. This is still, it's still working on visualizing the tree. <laughs> Okay, so here's the tree. I just wanted to show because I think it's really neat that you can actually uh, visualize the tree. Uh, so you can imagine this is the tree just based off of two features. But the big question is, does this do better? So do you all think that decision tree is going to do better than linear regression? Okay, drop, drop, drop your response in the comment section. Do you think decision tree is going to do way better than linear regression? You know, without even consider checking the performance metrics yet. Yeah. What that's, do you think our R two is going to be, or our root root mean squared error? Okay, Sharon. Oh, Sharon is saying yes, huh. and that okay, sounds we... like being affirmative here. I mean, I see Constant saying yes, <gasps> um, Kofri saying yes, uh, but Okello is saying nope. So okay. All right. Let's find out. Evaluate model, moment of truth. Oh, Voila. <laughs> it did worse. So the R2 is only 0.09 and wow. the 
root mean squared error is $63,000. <laughs> so why did it do worse? Um, does anyone, any thoughts about why, why it did worse on linear regression, worse than linear regression? Okay, now it look, that it you know work. that it doesn't come out well, you know, it did worse than the uh, linear regression. Why? Why do you think? Okay, thinking through that, take some water or two. Okay, good. Oh, everywhere silent. Nobody's trying to answer this. Mm. No, it's just you know, Google it. <laughs> 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 it's the psychic learn ah, and activation we, real uh, we, we got a response from Nasser uh, Dean, right. and him. So decision okay, yeah. three needs hyperparameters to me. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are actually going to try that. Yeah. Um, so, so tuning would help, um, generally the decision tree algorithm does have a tendency to overfit. So it probably fit that, uh, you know, it probably fit the test, uh, the training data. So it fit that training data really well. So it was probably a really good fit for that training data. But then once we tried it on the test data, it just, you know, fell apart. So the, this decision tree regressor, this particular one, will have a tendency to overfit. Um, so we need to use something that will compensate for its tendency to overfit on the training data. And this is a general thing about machine learning is trying to avoid overfitting. Okay, and Rahim also suggests doing hyper, hyper tuning. So we actually are gonna do some hyper tuning soon with a decision tree uh, algorithm as well. Yeah. So it, yeah. So I think I think it over it overfitted here. Um, so we need some way to compensate for the overfitting. There's a couple ways we can do that. Uh, one way is random forest, which was you know, suggested, I think, by Rahim a while back, right? So random forest is what's called an ensemble technique, and it tries to make up for the overfitting by applying an averaging function to multiple decision tree models to come up with a better overall model to try and you know avoid that overfitting. So let's try that random forest regressor. And it has such a good name too, random forest. You can just visualize it. You're like, oh, it's just a random forest of decision trees, right? Um, so here we can see that our R2 did improve from the decision tree algorithm, but it's actually still not as high as it was for linear regression. So even random forest, at least without um, hypertuning, even random forest is not doing as well as our simple linear regression. Uh, so, oh yeah, so oh, Sharon suggests evaluate in the model on the training data to see its performance. Yeah, I'd have to modify that function. That's a good idea though. Okay, so let's try one other ensemble method, which is gradient tree boosting. So this is another one that builds on decision trees, but instead of this kind of random decision trees and averaging, instead it, um, it kind of keeps on iterating on decision trees and, until it um, finds the best one. It tries to decrease its loss function. Uh, so this is what's known as a boosting, a boosting algorithm. So this one's called a, this is called a bagging algorithm. Like you have a bunch of stuff in the bag and you do something to it. This one's a boosting algorithm where you start with something and then you keep making it better and better. So here's our uh, gradient boosting regressor. And this one, look at, check out this R2 here. So here we've got an R2, our highest R2 yet. Now, Bye, it's still only, yeah, we're, it's still only four, it's, it's still only 14, uh, 14 though, and 61,000, which is still very high you know, very high amount to be off by if we're trying to predict salary, right? Because $61,000 is kind of an important amount of money. Uh, so what yes, can we do? Uh, I have a quick cool question. Hi, Pamela. I have a quick cool question coming from Sharon. It's really interesting because that is how people also think when they're starting out in data science joining. And right here, um, asking, can we evaluate the model on the trend data to see its performance? I mean, it, it's a valid thinking, but uh, it's so interesting. So what, what is your response to this? 
Well, I think it would just do really well, but that I think it wouldn't tell us anything, right? Because what we want to know is how would it do on on novel data? Because we're trying to build something that can that can predict based on new data. So I, I would suspect that it would do it, in, you know, very very well. <laughs> in fact, it's um, likely going to do hundred percent or ninety something percent because what you use to train is literally what you're exposing the model to again. So already yeah. I know these things almost known everything. So uh, that is not the best way to evaluate the efficiency or the accuracy of your model. You need to introduce it to a new set of data to actually confirm or validate that it has led something. You know, you need to test it on something else. So thank you. Yeah, I do think it would still be fun to do just to see, because I think a linear regression, I don't think we would get it 100% because I don't think that these points are in a, in a line. Decision tree, I think that's the thing about decision tree. I actually think you could get a decision tree that was 100% on the training data, but then absolutely fell apart in the in the test data, right? Uh, yes. So that's the thing about decision trees, they can be uh, deceiving. Yeah, so it's true. I think it could give you, it, it, that's true. It could, so Sharon, it could give us, it could give us insight as to whether our model is overfitting. Yeah, so I think that's a really good point. Yeah, these are such great ideas. I have, I, I'm going to go and like do so many things after. <laughs> all right. So let's, let's try the other things that you all suggested for improving the model. Um, so I think Rahim and a few others suggested tuning the hyperparameters. And then lots of people mentioned incorporating more features. So we're going to try both those things. Uh, so the first thing we do is tuning the hyperparameters. So the hyperparameters are the parameters of the way in which an algorithm is trained versus the parameters that are learned during an algorithm. So for example, for the gradient boosting regressor, there's a learning rate parameter and a number of estimators parameter. And these can be set to various things. So you could just go and just, you know, call it with these values and see how it does. But, you know, that's a lot of work to continually call it and see how it does. And, you know, um, what we can do instead is actually use a one of these um, classes that Scikit-Learn gives us that will search for the optimal hyperparameters. So I'm going to use grid search CV. So this you know is literally going to try each of these values out, each of the possible combinations of values out. So it's going to try 0 0.1 with 50, 100, 150. 0 0.5 with 50, 150, and 1.0 with 50, 100, 150. So it's going to try all of these possibilities that I've given it, and then it's going to re you know, report back as to which of them had the best fit. So, and this will take a bit longer to run since it is trying it uh, you know, six, six times here. So it takes a few seconds here. And there's other algorithms you could also use uh, to do this search. So there's a having search, there's a, uh, a random search. So you can check out other ways of uh, coming up with this, you know, best tuning. So here it says the best parameter combination is a 0.1 learning rate and 50 estimators. Okay. So we're going to remember that as for our model, since that's what came up with the best score. Yeah, and as people are saying, grid search is time, you know, can be time consuming because this is, you know, only here we've got, you know, only you know six combinations maybe. But um, if we had more combinations, actually nine, yeah, it'd be nine combinations, yeah. But as we'd have more parameters, there's there's more search space there. So you could also try things like the having search, which tries to kind of do like a binary search to find the best results. Okay, so let's see how that tuned model did. So it only got slightly better. All right, so just slightly better. I really wanted to get way, way better than this, right? Uh, you know, we've just been inching and I wanna, you know, I wanna make a big jump. So I'm gonna incorporate more features. And the good thing about this is exactly how it worked out. You know, when you get to work in any organization in a data science team, you don't get your first model being the most best performing. This process we are going to together is what you also go through. You know, you try many things, you will tune hyperparameters, you will try other algorithms, 
you know, you have more features. And again, again so uh, thank you, Pamela, for really showing us exactly and working us through this process together. Yeah, yeah. And then you discover maybe there's even more stuff you should find out. Because I was saying, I was reading the documentation this weekend for Scikit-Learn, and I discovered there's another, um, I think it's Hist Gradient Boosting Regressor uh, that uh, is somewhat new. It's, it's uh, I think it was introduced more recently, maybe. Yeah, new in version 0.21. And this one, I think, might actually do even better. So if any of you wants to fork, you know, fork the code and try this one out, I think this one would be worth a try too. All right, so let's- question. Cool question. On which platform are you running this? Yeah, so I'm actually just running in a local Jupyter notebook. I usually do notebooks in BizCode because you know you can open Jupyter notebooks in BizCode, but I am using this fancy plugin called Rise, which means I can do a presentation. Uh, so if any of you ever you know want to present your, um, Present your notebooks. It's really, really cool. Uh, let me find the documentation. Um, yeah, so Rise is a way that you can turn your local notebook into a presentation, uh, which I think is really cool. So I'm just on a local notebook right now running this uh, just because so that I can have this presentation mode here. Cool. All right. So Categorical features, we need more features. Clearly years of experience isn't quite predictive. And I think a big reason it's not predictive is because this is actually, you know, this is looking at developers from all across the world, um, developers that are, you know, full-time developers or just, you know, kind of do it on the side, developers with all sorts of educational levels. There's so many different things to consider. So I'm gonna add in three of those features and see how much better we can do. So we have educational level, country, and then main branch, which is just refers to a question where they asked, are you a developer 100% of the time or is it just something you do sometimes, right? Because lots of people do kind of development on the side. Like maybe some of you just do development on the side, right? Maybe your main job is uh, management or something and you just do some coding on the side. So that's what this question gets at. So I do some cleaning and then I visualize and see what this looks like. So we can see educational level, um, lots of differences there. Uh, most people are developer by profession, but some people do it on the side. And then there's lots of countries, so it's pretty hard to read that graph. Um, but I, I see the big line is probably United States, just based off of the bias in the data set with Stack Overflow being a, a starting as an English site. Uh, but there's lots of other countries too. All right, so now what we're gonna do is incorporate those features and what we're going to do is actually make a pipeline. So Scikit-Learn has this pipeline class that you can use in order to, uh, you know, do this whole process. And this is really, really nice. Uh, and I think this is what you're generally going to want to, to use um, so that you can, uh, you know, have more complex setups. Um, so first I'm going to get my data and this time I'm getting the numeric features and the categorical features. Categorical features. Um, then I'm going to make the pipeline. So first I tell the pipeline that I wanted to scale the numeric features from zero to one. And that's something that can help um, with making the, the model work better. Uh, then we're gonna do processing for categorical features. And we're gonna use something called one hot encoding because we need to turn categories into numbers, into numeric features. One way of doing that is one hot encoding. Um, that's not the only way of doing it. And as I mentioned, I think with the hist gradient boosting regressor, you actually don't need to do that. Uh, but for this one, we do need to use one high encoding and it's gonna it's gonna turn them into things like vectors like 0010100. Zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero. Uh, and then finally, uh, we're going to uh, transform those columns and make a pipeline with the preprocessor and the model and then fit the, you know, fit that all on the training data. So this is gonna do everything for us. Let's try it out. And this is using the gradient boosting regressor hypertuned model from before. And this will take, you know, this one will take a little time, but actually that already, it went. So let's go and see how it does. All right, what do we think? 
what's our any predictions for either r2 or our root mean squared error like how how off are the salary predictions this time this time we had a bunch more features well let's let's see let's see if you have some and if those predictions are actually correct uh well i <laughs> i showed okay. it so we've got because we've of time. got we have yeah 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 so we have an r2 of 0.45 look at that r2 have we have we uh, maybe impressed <laughs> yeah we do want it ideally a bit higher there are more features we could consider uh but 0.45 from 0.14 is a big boost and as we see like so the biggest benefit we got was from incorporating more features so that makes me think we should probably incorporate even more features right um and then our but our salaries are still off by fifty thousand, actually so that's interesting that we got a much bigger r2 um but we're still off by a significant amount so it's it means it's hard to get the salaries to be really really on <laughs> All right. Okay. So we have 10 minutes left. So we still need to turn this into an API. So let's do that. Okay. So we have a model. It's not perfect. I encourage all of you to fork this code and to add more features and try out different regressors and try and improve that R2. Uh, but for now we have this model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dump that model into a, uh, I'm going to pickle it. So the pickling is a way of storing a Python object so that you can unpickle it later and use it. So I want to pickle it so that I can use it uh, in on my server uh, in my API. So I'm using joblib. Uh, so joblib, let me delete this one. Joblib is a very performant way of, uh, of pickling a model. You can also use the Python pickle module, but it's nowhere near as fast. So much better if you're dealing with scikit-learn models to use joblib. So I'm going to do that, and that's going to save it into this model.pkl binary file. And then, uh, how would I actually use this? So if I wanted to use this file, I would call joblib.load. So that loads in the model and unpickles it. <laughs> it's a funny phrase, but it unpickles it so that now we've got that, that model again. And then I would need to create a new piece of data and say, here's my new sample. And then I would tell the model to predict based off this new sample and then get the prediction out. Uh, so, oops, I think I added a V there. Here we go. Okay, so I put in uh, my data and it predicted that I would get 174,000. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh, so this is how we would use a stored model. So we're gonna use this code when we deploy this onto the server, right? This is the only, thing we need to do in order to make it usable by other people who want to make predictions. We don't need, we don't want to, you know, retrain the model. That's what takes a lot of time, right? We just need to use that model that we've already trained. So let's turn it into an HTTP API. Uh, so what we're going to do is we want to make an HTTP API. So an HTTP API is something where we can send an HTTP request, either a get or a post. We send it to some URL. We, and we give it parameters. So we say, you know, for this number of coding years and for this educational level, you know, I want you to make a prediction. So we're going to send that HP request and then get back a response that has the result. And so I wanted to respond back with JSON because JSON is a very common data format. So I'm going to deploy to Azure Functions, uh, which is a really nice place to deploy APIs to. It's you know, fairly low cost. It's it's only up, uh, you know, when it's actually responding to requests. So if nobody's using it, that's not a big deal. So that's where I'm going to deploy. Um, this is my Azure function code. I am using uh, Fast API. Fast API is a really cool way of building APIs in Python. It's a it's a, a package that the community has written, and it's both fast in terms of like, you know, the, the speed of the code, but also just fast in terms of getting an API made. So I'm trying to make this API. So I tell it that it's going to be on this route and these are the parameters it's going to take. So it says it's taking years coding, which is an integer, years coding pro, which is an int, educational level, which is a string, dev status string, country string. Okay, so this is what my API is like. And then it returns back a salary, 
that uses that prediction code. Okay, um, just before you move forward, um, I just want to maybe quickly clarify this and the learning that is coming from this phase. You built your model. Now you want to deploy it somewhere that it's easily accessible, that you can call it over the internet and it will respond to you. And we're trying to use this as your function because it's low cost, uh, meaning it does not bear any cost unless it is used. If you do not call it in a month, it's not recalling, it's not actually being charged for that. And for you to deploy that, you also need to have this script available, which is the libraries you need to imp import, the, the, also the wrap, the first API, which is more or less a wrapper around uh, the model you built so that it's, uh, when you send in these parameters, it should return this. That's exactly what you are defining in that notebook. And this can be that major learning milestone for you in case you have not deployed your model in the past. So pay attention to this. Go through this video again and try to practice and make sure you get it done. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for summarizing that. So yeah, this is our function code. So this all we're uploading to the function is this file, um, the pickled model. So that's a, a binary file, so I can't really show it to you. Um, requirements.txt, which just says these are the packages needed by the function. And then just a few you know, pieces of data needed by the function um, for configuration. So that's that's it. That's our, you know, that's what we're uploading. We don't need to upload the notebook, right? The notebook is our preparation stage. But once we have the model pickled, that's all we need in order to, you know, deploy it. Uh, so how do I actually deploy it? So yeah, so I use something called the Azure Dev CLI. Um, so I'll start running it, but probably we won't have enough time to watch it through. But I've already deployed it, so that's okay. Um, but AZD. It, the Azure Dev CLI is a really nice way of deploying to Azure. I've already logged in. So it, if I hadn't logged in, it would prompt me to log in. Um, but I've already logged in here. And so first thing it does, it tries to uh, provision all the resources. And I've actually already provisioned these. So it should be able to do that um, fairly quickly. Um, but for a function, it needs to provision, uh, it needs to provision a function app. Uh, it needs to provision like an analytics workspace so I can see how things are doing. Uh, it provisions a storage account, which stores the code. So it does actually provision uh, several resources in Azure. And that's what's nice about this command here is that it's going to provision all those things for me. And it's doing it based off a bicep file. This is like infrastructure as code. Uh, so this bicep file here says, OK, I'm making a function app. I'm making a hosting plan. I'm making a storage account. Um, and I've already written this for you, so all of you can just use this this file, right? You don't need to. You can just keep it the way it is. It's perfect. <laughs> um, and so it's see, it's already provisioned, and now it's deploying the API. So this is actually uploading the code. So it's deploying it right now. Um, but I already did that, so we can go back here. So this is what it would look like uh, when you were first deploying it. It would tell you everything that it created. So all these all these things in the portal. And you could check it out later in your as your account, and then it would say where it deployed to, and so then we could go to this URL and um, and check it out. And what you see actually immediately is you get a not found because I haven't hit up the API URL, right? I need to hit up the actual API URL. So let's try an actual API call. So here it is. So this is going to my function to the model predict path. And then pass can, can you can you zoom a little? We yeah. really can't see that. Uh, actually, I never learned how to zoom on a Mac. Uh, ah, <laughs> um, in fact, we're gonna zoom the video. Right here. Outside. I mean, this is what the <laughs> yeah yeah here. Good. So you know the Azure URL and then slash all of this, right? So I'm passing the parameters in on the URL. Um, or actually, what I'll do. So then, the cool thing about Fast API. Fast API generates documentation for you. This is what's so is so cool. I just really freaking love it. So it generates the documentation for you. I didn't have to do any work. This is all generated for me. This is interactive documentation. I can click try it out and I can put in, you know, my uh, my details here. Um, and I'd have to remember, you know, uh, how to write all these things here. But I can put them all in and then execute it. And then it'll actually execute the that API call and show me the results. 
So this is what I really, really love about Fast API is how easy it is to do this. Now, the thing I don't love is that here it's that, you know, I, I don't remember what to put for educational level, country or dev status because they were kind of long string values, right? Ideally, I want a drop down. So the next thing I'm going to do, and I'll just do this fast, is uh, make these into uh, actual categories that people can select drop downs. Um, so the way to do that in Fast API is when you're specifying the parameters, is that you give it a type, which is actually a Python enum. Okay, so it says education level is categories.ed level. And then when we look at categories file, this is a Python enum. This is something enums are kind of new to Python. Maybe you haven't seen those before, but uh, you know, it just has all the possible values, right? So we have them for each of them. And then I actually generated this enums file because it seemed like a lot of work to write this all out. So I actually generated it just based off my, uh, you know, my features list. So, you know, why, why write code when you can write code that writes code for you? <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, redeploying the function. And now in the new documentation, when we check it out, sorry that I'm speed moding, but I know we're close to the end here. <laughs> yes. Yes, Frank, yeah, Frank uh, Felix, your question, I'm happy that you've, you know, seen some solutions around it, that a drop down could actually fix this, but not always. Uh, what if you are assessing it via an API? You know, you are calling it by an API, you still need to pass that parameter. So wherever you are assessing it, that's where you also control that. If it's through an application that someone is putting value, you have to control the input for that place mm -hmm. so that I can pass exactly that input to the API is calling, or you use this kind of option that is being demonstrated there. Awesome. Yeah, so Fast API does give various options. So Fast API automatically does error handling like this one where it says value is not a valid enumeration member. So Fast API, you know, will will say if something's not part of the dropdown. Um, so there's a lot of error handling already built into Fast API. You can even do on Azure, you can use Azure API management and you can set up policies for parameter validation. So if you want to do it at an even higher level before it even gets to your Python code, you can actually do that if you wrap it in an Azure API management policy. And I actually do that for a lot of my APIs um, because then you can even do like throttling and rate limiting. So like make sure that people aren't you know hitting up your API too much. So you can do a lot of really cool stuff uh, when you use that Azure API management. Um, but Fast API does actually do quite a bit of, um, you know, letting you know what's wrong. Or even if I just leave off the parameters, it'll tell me which ones are missing. So this is what's really, really cool about Fast API. Why I think it's a super fun way to, uh, you know, super fast, super fun way of turning a model into an API. And like the thing is, the way I've done this, the way I've written all this code, if any of you fork this code and just add in some more features. You can just run, you know, run the, you know, run the code, and then you should have an API that has those new features as dropdowns, you know, automatically, which I think is just so cool. So that's what gets me super excited about it. Um, so okay, so yeah, so we did kind of blaze through that deployment stat. Let's see, uh, and you can see that my AZD did actually deploy. So I did just deploy another uh, version of this. So I now have three, I actually have three of these deployed right now because it's so easy to deploy. Why not just deploy another one? <laughs> so this is actually another, another, um, another one deployed that I just deployed. Uh, so next steps. Uh, so these slides were based off of the Microsoft Learn module about training and evaluating regression models. Uh, so I recommend going through these if, um, if you want to go into more depth on building the model that I showed. Uh, you can check out the code for this example and try adding more features, try different things and try to point it yourself and let me know if you have any issues. Uh, you can learn more about creating Azure functions. Uh, you can learn about other ways to host Python in Azure. So we could have done a container app. We could have done an app service. Uh, we could have done Kubernetes. We, we can do so many, you know, you can host in all kinds of ways. Uh, and you could even host the model uh, on, you know, do all this model training on Azure using the Azure ML SDKs. So there's tons of options, um, but hopefully this gives you some ideas about where to, you know, where to go. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Pamela, for this highly engaging, exciting um, session. 
lot to learn from here. And you know, people asking questions, please do follow. If you follow on Twitter, you're going to definitely get. Um, uh, you see Pamela Fox on Twitter. You see her, I'm doing. If you follow me, you're going to see more about um, some things I posted about 30 days of learning, and you'll be able to follow her. Don't forget the link to the code repo is right here on the screen, where you can fuck it on GitHub, and we expect you to come up with you know better performing model. Uh, come up with you know your own deployment. And anytime you are sharing this on Twitter or LinkedIn, use the hashtag of science. It makes it easy for us to see your work, celebrate you, and create the attention that your potential recruiter actually needs to validate. Yes, this guy is learning. This uh, or this girl baby is learning, and we need to support him or her with growth. Okay, and the last thing I'm going to also share here is this. Uh, the 30 days, this link right on the screen, will give you access to all the resources we have. aka.ms slash 30 days of slash data science. It takes you to the landing page of data science roadmap. Everything we've done up to now, and those that we're still going to do, you get to see them right on that page. Any final word from you, Pamela? Uh, I know we rushed through the end part there. So if you do have any follow-up questions about fast API, Azure functions, whatever, please ask. Um, I'll go ahead and like maybe enable discussions on this repo. So if you want to ask there, if you want to tweet me, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do, um, you know, please, please, please do. <laughs> and I and I'll also add a README to this repo too. You should always have a README on your repos. <laughs> Yeah, great. But thank you everyone. Thank, you, thank you for all the participation and ideas in the chat. And uh and actually I, I learned a bunch from all of you too. So thank you. Thanks, 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 thanks for, for for the gift of your time. I can't wait to go back and also lay my hands on the notebook and you know run these codes and, uh, and showcase what I'm doing. Please don't forget as you land on this page, there are class key challenge for you to participate in. For example, the learning resource Pamela shared is part of the modules in the Cloud Key Challenge that you should take. So if you've not take, uh, if you've not participated in the Cloud Key Challenge, please go ahead and participate. And also, if you have issues while you are trying things out, on the discussion page, on the landing page, you will see the GitHub discussion where you can also raise product feedback issues or you know call the attention of moderators that are there. They will definitely support you and your growth. Until next. Thursday, meaning in next two days, we're having another session. This time around, we are building a classification machine learning model. Hopefully, it's going to be a credit card fraud detection model. You want to come again and learn. Today is about regression. Next time, is going to be about the classification, which are still part of supervised machine learning. Come see again how we build that model and how we get it deployed. I mean, are you too excited? Okay. Thank you very much, and I'm going to say bye-bye for now, and see you later.